Welcome to the Wild and Curious podcast, a show that's part travel, part feminism, and completely inspired by extraordinary women worldwide. I'm Teresa Christine. And I'm Suzanne Schmetting. Are you excited to talk about wine today? (laughs) T, you're such a great journalist. You always ask questions that I love to answer. Yes. (laughs) Yes, I'm excited to talk about wine today. I'm excited to talk to women who make wine Yes, for me to drink and women who are doing, doing incredible things that maybe wouldn't have been possible before. It's true. Today we have a guest on the show who is in South Africa mm-hmm. and She is actually the the first black female winemaker in the country. And that is a landmark. It's a landmark. It is absolutely crazy when you think about where South Africa was, in particular with apartheid, which happened very recently, you know, in in the terms of world history. Yeah, no, of course. And it's always really exciting to get to talk to people who are, you know, I think on surface level, you're like, oh, a female winemaker, big deal. But she has really overcome a lot to be where she is. Right. And, you know, we we had a winemaker previously on the show, Pauline Lapierre. Beautiful. Um, Thank you. You have such a good French accent. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I love to use it. Um, But, you know, she, she had mentioned when we spoke to her that it was, it wasn't quite as male dominated as you might think, because it's, it's part of the, you know, the lore and the history of the country and people are raising their families and they pass it on to their daughters. But in South Africa, it's a very, very different thing. So being the first female winemaker and the first black female winemaker is a big deal. That's what's so cool about getting to do this show too. I mean, there's like a billion cool things about it, but to get to hear people's different perspectives around the world, you know, like Pauline's experience is totally true. Like Mm -hmm. that is her experience and how she has viewed winemaking and how it has played out for her. Yeah. And the woman that we're talking to today it's very different. Like she's also a mind maker, but it's just a totally different world. Today we are talking with Nitsiki Biela. She is a South African winemaker and the first female winemaker in the country. So South African wines, we are known to be the best of both worlds. Reason being, actually, we are, um, our wines are more, they've got that fruitiness of the new world wine styles, but at the same time, there's that austerity on the wines, which is of the old world wines. And with the fact that uh, South Africa has about more than 350 years, so it's a really, in, in reality, it's a really old industry, but in terms of character, it's new world wines, but plus the old old wine styles. Uh, so in that way, then we've got the best of both. So in the class, we'll basically get the best of both worlds. Mm. Do you have a favorite? Like the one where you're like, you absolutely have to try this kind of South African wine? That's a difficult question because I can tell you, you definitely <laughs> have to try Aslina Umsasane. That you have to try. Which one? Umsasane from Aslina Wines. Okay. Which is our Bordeaux blend. All right. Yeah. What what kind of notes or like what does it taste like? It's got undertones of earthiness, which is what I like the most. And then you get a bit of black currants. So more of the earthy of a second. That's a sort of like a hint of the old world wines. But at the same time, you pick up a lot of black currants in the wine. So it's, um mm. yeah, and it's beautiful, bold, structured. And uh, I, what I like the most is that every time I smell, I drink that wine. Is like I'll smell the empty glass, and every time I go back to the glass, I pick up different characters. Oh my gosh, oh. I can almost taste it. You're describing it so well, and that makes me want to have a drink at 8 a.m. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and also that one, it's called umsasan. Umsasan is a Zulu word for the acacia tree, and the acacia tree is the iconic tree in Africa. So it's like a tree of life, really. And but the reason the name is on the bottle is because it's my grandmother's nickname. Oh, yeah, that's so sweet. Love that. That's really cool. So why why were you inspired 
I guess, to, to get into wine and ultimately to start your own winery? I, it, I wasn't really inspired by anything to get into wine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just, um, I needed to change my life. It was an opportunity. Um, I wanted to study and I, I couldn't get any scholarship and the wine industry, um, the South African Airways basically offered a scholarship to study winemaking and I took it. Oh, that's awesome. So you started working at a different winery initially. Yes. And then you started your own. I finished my studies in 2004. I worked for an established winery for 13 years. And then after 13 years, I resigned. And basically it was growth and progression. And um, so it's just one of those, like it's progress. Next step, what do we do? Then uh, And then I started um, Aslina. But I have, even while I was a student, I wanted to start my own company. That I knew. It's just that when I was a student, I wasn't sure what kind of a company. Oh, that's awesome. You're definitely like an entrepreneur. So I'm curious to know, you know, apartheid was not so long ago in South Africa. Yeah. And aside from being a Black person, you're also a, a woman starting your own business. What challenges have you faced in those regards? I think most of the challenges I faced while I was a winemaker. Um, firstly, it's one of those where people, I, I, I represent what is completely different from the norm. Uh, so people will come to the winery, they're expo, when you say a winemaker, they already know the picture of a winemaker, what a winemaker looks like. So as I'll be coming through there, not expecting me to be the winemaker first and foremost. So I'll get there and they will still ask me for the winemaker. And be like, um, <laughs> yeah. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can't blame them. They, it's like they all all their life, they know a winemaker is a, a white man or old man. And so that's basically, yeah. Yeah, like breaking that stereotype. It messes with people's heads. Exactly. And if, even um, when it comes to consumers, you could see they've got doubts. Do you really know what you're going to be telling me? What uh, what are you going to be talking about or something? Uh, and less what ha will happen is people will be tasting one, they'll be explaining the one, and then they'll ask me, so what makes you be so knowledgeable about this? And <laughs> my response will be like, because I made it. It's my wine. <laughs> so it's... Um, yeah. All right. So th that's got to be like a little bit frustrating. I know. Um, <laughs> but what what is the most rewarding part of your job, aside from blowing people's minds that you're a woman and a winemaker? Most exciting part of my job is when I, okay, let me just say, you know, have a season, it's a festivity. It's hectic, late hours and all, but it's festive. Yeah. Um, but I love blending. Mm. I love when I have to basically put these different components together and just to see what's going to come out at the end. So you've got these different personalities who has to be together and something exciting come out. How do you, like, what is the process for blending? And I mean, what is your internal thought process as you're going through this? Like what makes you enjoy it so much? Um, when it's like, I, before I even blend, I know, okay, I want to have what blend is because I kept, 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 like, kept, kept Frank and Petit Vedo. I knew that's what I'm going to make. But then when I taste the individual um, varietals, then I need to decide how, which one is the strongest, which one I'm going to make the majority in the blend. And mm. then from there, then start making really small samples to play around in terms of volumes and percentages. But now that I've already started with the blend, I just benchmark with the previous one and so that I've got almost the same character, not character, but same style and following of the same wine uh, and even better wine, obviously, with the next vintage. Mm. So then I'll yeah. make small samples, blend, change percentages and do as close as possible to the previous one and taste it and see what comes out of each. And then I'll choose, sometimes I'll be left with like three wines and then I'll choose what, whatever the last one that has to be, which is the last one standing. You make it sound like an artistic thing almost. I've never thought of winemaking in that way. It is because you, it's basically like you're having your brush and painting yeah. a picture. Oh, yeah. So except that your picture is in a bottle. 
<laughs> I love that. No, it's like it's like a little bit of magic potion making. You know, it's, it's yes, yes. <laughs> I like that like magic exactly. potion. No, it is. I've I, I've known a couple of of winemakers who who've done harvest and have you know bottled their their own small brews and like it's the magic that kind of comes from it and the excitement that goes into it. It's 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 really fascinating and it's it's sort of a fun playtime. And, uh, but something that probably isn't as much like playtime is you also do, do work as one of the directors of the board for Pinotage Youth Development Ad Academy. And I would just love to hear about the work that you're doing there and, and sort of what you envision for the future. So the Pinotage Youth Development Academy, what we do, we're training young people, um, young people of color through the value chain of the wine industry and we do, do job placement so that actually they can contribute meaningfully in their society or in the society and slowly grow themselves to, you know, to the best oh. human, best community people. Um, and yeah. so um, what the course that are being offered, it's, a, it's like wine tourism they will do, because when they get out of there, it's winemaking, wine tourism and... And, and anything that is closer to hospitality. So when they get out there, they can work as tasting room managers. They can some they can continue and do so become sommeliers because they also do WSCT courses, um, and some they end up being tour guides and all that. So it is sort of like giving someone a stepping stone to to greater pastures. Um, mm. Yeah, because these are young people who've grown up around the industry. They know the industry way it is, but they've never felt as being part of the industry because it's like something that they look across. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard sometimes when you feel like you don't have that just foot in the door. That's all that you need sometimes. Yes, yes, yes. You just need that foot in the door. What kind of things have people who have gone through the Pinotage Youth Development Academy, what have they gone on to do that, you know, makes this such a rewarding thing to do? I know some of the, I still call them students, they are graduates. <laughs> oh my word. Um, some, they're, like I know the other, some are working as like tasting room managers, some are like sommeliers, and then others are even on the cruise ships. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I know the other one, he's a wine steward uh, sommelier in, in Dubai. So, like, they, like, literally, wow. they've spread their wings. That's awesome. <laughs> You've helped do that. That's so cool. They've spread their wings. So, the, 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 the way the academy started, actually, it was funded by the UK, um, the M. Hilaro Cropper Foundation. Um, it was, uh, there were people, how they found it, how it was founded, actually. Uh, it was inspired by one of the guys who's working at the tasting room in French Rook. And he, when they were asking him whether he was in a, an official training to do that, he was like, no. And they, they asked if there's there any official training school for this. They were like, no. Was like, oh. So that's how this whole started, the whole thing started. And oh. so I was basically, at the beginning, I got invited to be a part of the advisory board. And then from then, then I joined the to be the director on the board. That's awesome! It's so great that you're involved in that. Um, it's it's not just really for them. Also, I I also benefit in this in a sense that every time I see these young people, they remind me of myself. They help oh. me to keep grounded. I I see myself in them. I see, yeah. It's just it's one of those beautiful things. I see myself in them. Oh, I love that. Now with Aslina Wines, what is there anything? exciting or new happening right now or in the future that you want to share with anybody that you want to share with the, <laughs> the listeners no pressure please thank you <laughs> um currently no there's nothing happening now we're just basically focusing on on growing the volumes as we are hoping to have our own production facility in the near future but we need to get to a certain volume first before we can so we have to build the market and once the market um once we've got enough our places where we're selling our wines, um, not enough, but once we've got we've reached a certain amount of bottles that we know we are selling, they've got allocation, then we can actually start looking at having our own facility. I 
I never thought of wine and mixing wine as being such an artistic and beautiful thing. Aww. That was really lovely, the way she described it. Yeah. I don't know, because sometimes you hear winemakers talk about wine and you're just nodding along. You're like, yes, nutty flavors, <laughs> bold finish. And she she had really, I don't know, she like really took you on that journey. And then also just hearing about actually mixing the wine, it, it sounds incredibly special. She did have a really lovely way of doing it. And she got so excited when when we related that it was just like, so it's like a potion? And she was like, yes! <laughs> She's like, exactly. That's what I want. She's going to do a whole <laughs> rebrand of Aslina Wines. <laughs> oh my gosh. I would love to be responsible for that. Aslina Potions. And it's such a beautiful name too. I love that it's named after her grandmother. You know, it's yeah. just like like this whole legacy that she's creating. If you would like to learn more about Nsiki's Winery, you can go to aslinawines.com. That's A-S-L-I-N-A-W-I-N-E-S.com. Or you can follow the winery on Instagram at at aslina underscore wines. If you enjoy listening to the Wild and Curious podcast and would like to contribute to helping us make this thing run, you can. You can Venmo us at the Wild and Curious or via PayPal at paypal.me slash the Wild and Curious. Anything you send, big or small, will go towards the costs of running a podcast that's dismantling the patriarchy. It means so much to us when people rate our show in iTunes and leave reviews. We read those sweet nothings and yes, we cry about them. We also love it when people send our podcast to someone who they think will enjoy it. Feminists sharing feminist content is the best.